Good afternoon, everybody, uh, or good evening, I guess, if you're on the East Coast. Like, I am on the West Coast, so it's still afternoon here. But uh, welcome again to week three of our Building Energy Efficiency Redesign course. Um, my name is Rob Best. I wasn't uh, one of the lecturers last week, but I was the first week, so you may remember me from that. And today we're going to be talking about uh, whole building design and energy analysis. And specifically, we're going to be thinking about new buildings. So to give you a refresher on where we are, we started with an overview of the reasons for efficiency, the climate implications, the reasons, and how we use energy in buildings. Uh, Karen last week walked us through a great overview of the retrofit space and some of the work that she does in Chicago, thinking about how we address where buildings are wasting or using energy when they're in the existing stock, and then how we can improve those. So today we're going to start thinking about commercial or new, sorry, not necessarily commercial, but new buildings. We'll talk about residential buildings first, then commercial buildings. And then next week we're going to have Aaron Lennox come lecture about some of the advanced materials and advanced designs that you can implement in new buildings that are pushing the envelope of sustainability. So first, I want to start by motivating the question about what exactly does a sustainable building look like? Now, about 10 years ago, this project here at, at um, Oberlin College was completed. This was, at the time, hailed as one of the most sustainable buildings in the world, in the country, if not the world, if not maybe the most sustainable building. It was one of the first net zero energy buildings that was certified. We talked about uh, net zero in week one. It was also a living building, certified building. Again, something, a concept from week one of the course. And it has a whole variety of uh, very cool, very interesting features on it. It's got a whole bunch of PV. This lake right in front that you see here is both a cooling feature and a water reclamation pond, so it treats its gray water. Lots of natural lighting through those windows. It's very hyper-insulated. Really high-performing building. But is it really... So, so how did we get here, I guess is the question. It really is an excellent building. How did we get to something so comprehensive and something so well designed? Well, part of the answer starts from thinking about what sustainability actually means. So if we start with the definition of sustainability that was kind of the most canonical definition that we have in life cycle assessment and any sort of sustainability field, uh, it goes back to a, a group called the Brundtland Commission, which was a UN, report, UN commission and UN report in 1987, where they called sustainability development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So what this means is that we need to think carefully about how we're going to use resources today so that we don't sacrifice the ability of all those who come after us to meet their own. If we go back to this building for a moment, this Oberlin College building, and we think about how it's using resources. It's processing its own gray water. It's producing its own energy. It's able to reduce its energy consumption. All of these things are really meeting comfort criteria, needs of whoever's occupying this building, while also making sure that we're using those resources in the best possible way. But there's another aspect that the Oberlin building has yet to live up to. Not its fault. It's just the fact that it hasn't been around that long. And really, in the buildings world, when we think about sustainability, what that means is we want to make sure that whatever we design is built to last. There are wonderful examples of buildings that have been around for a very, very long time. Here we see four. We see the Empire State Building. We see Notre Dame in Paris. We see um, some of the buildings in Varanasi in India along um, the most sacred section of the Ganges River, and we see some of the Pueblos in New Mexico. And if we think about the age of these buildings, you may be surprised to know that the Empire State Building, which is one of our oldest icons in this country, is actually the youngest one on this slide, up to 1,000 years old. Some of the buildings that we still use, that we still occupy, are hundreds, if not thousands, of years old. Certainly, this is a good example of sustainability for a variety of reasons. First of all, it means that the materials aren't turning over in the buildings. But second, it means that there's clearly a social structure that allows these to be in place for so long and still be so useful. That's something that may not be affected in the building design, but it's certainly something to think about when we think about constructing new buildings and sustainability. If we're putting up a building like that at Oberlin College, say, in the middle of nowhere, where there's no other service around it, is it truly sustainable new construction? That's certainly something to think about. So let's start by talking now about residential buildings. We hinted at this in the, the first lecture that just by virtue of improving the construction stock, we're getting better at constructing buildings. We're reducing the energy. 
if we see in this graph here on the far left, we have the average energy consumption of buildings in the United States. They use quite a lot of energy. We see the heat requirement as a proxy here for total energy consumption, heating being the largest source of energy we learned in residential buildings. Kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. The average building in this country uses over 200 kilowatt hours a year per square meter. Well, in 1977, 1973 to 77, we had the OPEC oil crisis. We had sudden implementation of energy efficiency regulations. So that by the mid-80s, new buildings were already about 50% better than they were. Uh, maybe not quite 50%, but dramatically better than they had been before that. Since the 1980s, we've continuously improved these energy efficiency standards so that we have, in the mid-90s, continuous improvement by uh, the 2000s, late 2000s. We have a lot more low energy houses. We're getting now where we started at 220. We're down now to about 80. And then if we keep thinking about applications of insulation, other technologies, we're getting down even far lower. So the heating requirement for each house is now a fifth almost of what it was, a quarter to a fifth of what it was uh, in the average case. Some of the more advanced metrics now in California, all homes have to be new energy, sorry, net zero energy by 2020, with all buildings required to be two, net zero energy by 2030. Those kinds of standards just will automatically push reduction in energy efficiency. So the question is, as our building stock turns over, we're going to be more energy efficient, but how do we get there? How were we able to get from the average building using, the average home using nearly 240 kilowatt hours per square meter per year uh, down to now about 45 to 50. The key here, and one of the biggest transitions that the entire construction industry has had to make over the last 30 years, is to really integrate energy efficiency and energy efficient design at the very beginning of the process. It cannot be an afterthought. It has to be something that's integral to the design and then cuts across the architecture, the construction the mechanical engineering, the electrical, the plumbing, the structural engineering even, all of it has to work together if we really want to get to those highest levels of, of high performing new buildings. When you actually go out and talk to the practitioners in the field and ask them, well, why don't you do green buildings? We know that they're more efficient. We know that they're better for the environment. And in some cases, we know it's the law. Well, many people say that it's a higher cost. This is actually a fallacy, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through. The fact that most owners think that green building costs more has been disproven multiple times, but the reason it still exists is because it's not integrated up front. What you end up with is an idea where you've already designed a building, and then halfway into the process you say, oh no, we want to reduce the energy. We want this to be a more sustainable structure. At that point, changing the windows, changing the lights, involves a whole lot of re-engineering and therefore a higher cost of the project that we would have eliminated if we thought about it up front. If you ever hear uh, Amory Lovin speak or read any of his works, uh, he runs, founded and runs the Rocky Mountain Institute, he'll talk about the idea of tunneling through the cost barrier, that basically by putting more upfront design into the building, you can reduce the amount of equipment that's required in the building to the point where, yes, I may be spending more in design, but by reducing all of this need for capital cost on mechanical equipment or electrical equipment, we can actually reduce the overall cost of the structure. So he'll even argue that not only is it not a cost barrier, it's a cost saving to build as green as we possibly can. And if I haven't beaten this home enough, what this really means is that green has to be the goal from day one. Only if it's the start, only if it's the goal at the very start can we leverage passive strategies to build the best possible buildings that we can. Now what I mean by passive strategies is this. If we start with, say, the average energy consumption that a building requires, and I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, but uh, looking at this bar on the left-hand side of the chart, this, say, is the average building. It's the average baseline. We have a series of steps here that we want to take in our design process from the average as we're thinking about how we're going to achieve our goal of a low energy building. The first is that we want to actually reduce the load. If there's anything that's just not needed in the building, we want to take that out. We want to make sure that we're managing the load properly. Now, once we've done it, this could be, say, for instance, using CFLs instead of incandescent lights or even now LEDs, which are cost efficient. And if anybody hasn't seen this news, uh, a few weeks ago, GE, one of the largest light bulb manufacturers in the world, announced that they will no longer make anything except LED bulbs because the cost point is that good now. So that's one way of reducing load. 
but we still need a certain amount of lighting, heating, cooling, etc. So our next tool in our toolbox should be passive strategies. These are things like uh, adding insulation, better windows, using daylighting instead of electric lighting altogether. Once we've done that, we're left with what we consider the active loads. There's nothing we can do passively anymore. We've brought all the energy in or gotten all the energy out or reduced the need for it as much as possible. So now we're going to think about making our air conditioner efficient or making our uh, pumps, if we're in a large commercial building, moving water around. We're going to make those more efficient. Once we've done that, there still may be a certain amount of heat that we're removing. For instance, all of us right now, I can fully guarantee, are looking at computers in some fashion. Maybe you're on your phone. Okay, maybe I lose 100% of the time. But uh, you're looking at some device that uses electricity. It's also producing heat. And we have to get that heat out of the building if you are, say, like me, in sunny California where it's about 80 degrees outside today. 80 degrees outside means I don't want more heat inside as it is. So I've got to get that out. Well, maybe I can actually recover that and use it for, I don't know, heating the water that I'm going to use in the shower later. Pretty good strategy there. Rather than just pushing the heat to the atmosphere and then firing a boiler, we can actually recover it. And then finally, we want to think about using on-site renewables or off-site renewables and other offsets to get ourselves from where we started down to a very low energy building or something that's actually generative on site and therefore reducing our environmental footprint. So let's keep getting more concrete here. Let's talk about a series of design strategies that we actually want to go through when we think about this. Now this design pathway is valid whether you're talking about a residential building, commercial building, an industrial building, excuse me for a second, or any other type of structure that we might consider. It doesn't matter what the use is. The process is always the same. We want to first look at the orientation of the building. That's going to be orientation with the site, with environmental factors. Uh, sometimes this is influenced heavily by social parameters rather than environmental, but we want to consider to the extent that we can the ability to orient with the environment. Second, we want to think about reducing the energy load. I talked a little bit about what that means. Then we're going to talk about think about passive energy, efficient systems, recovery, and finally renewables. So we're following that same pathway, but instead we're going to start here with one that wasn't included in that previous chart, orientation. So when we think about orientation, very often we're given a site and we have to fit the building to the site. In fact, in many ways this is the best way to go about it. We want to choose our site first because we want a high density of services around our building. Again, if it's going to be truly sustainable, we want it to last. In order to make it last, what do I need? If I'm going to build a house, I want it to be near schools, near hospitals, near grocery stores. I don't want it, well, maybe I do want it in certain cases to be in the middle of the woods or be far from anything, but for the most part, we get a lot of benefits socially and environmentally from concentrating our development. So say we already have a site. We still may have some variables that we can play with within that site to make our building more energy efficient as quickly or as, as best as we possibly can. So the three things we're going to think about here are sun, wind, and terrain. And we'll walk through each of these in turn. And we want to think about them both environmentally, but also especially if we're designing a house, we want to think about the social benefits that they incur. One thing that I will keep hitting over and over in this lecture is that when I talk about sustainable building design, I know we're talking specifically about energy in this course, but when we take a more holistic view of sustainability, we don't want it just to be about environment. We're going to make sure at the same time that we're going to save money, or at least not spend extra money, and that it's a place that people actually want to spend time. And that second one is so critical because, well, I grew up, for instance, in the suburbs of LA, and there are a lot of places in the suburbs of LA where they're bedroom communities. You go there to sleep, not really because you want to spend time there. So we want to make sure that our places are locations that, that we all want to actually inhabit. So some of our key tools here are going to be thinking about where the windows, the skylights, any overhangs, vegetation, roof coverings, and shading elements are, and how the overall massing and structure of the building can rotate or move within our site to take advantage of different environmental variables. Now as I go through this, I do want to reiterate, if you have any questions, feel free to just send those over the chat box, raise your hand, or um, get my attention some other way. I'm happy to, to answer questions as we go rather than waiting all till the end. So let's start with orientation towards the sun. Something we all learn in elementary school, the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, 
something that we don't necessarily think about is what does that actually mean if you are living in a house? From a very personal and behavioral perspective, there are really four, three or four different characteristics of sunlight that we really try and take advantage of. First, sunlight from the east has a much softer quality than sunlight from the west. There's actually more of the blue spectrum light that exists in the morning uh, than in the later afternoon when the, sun, the light tends to be more in the red-orange spectrum. It has some interesting effects on perception. And this has been tested in laboratories. There's a great um, experimental facility at Berkeley that does a ton of testing of environmental variables on humans and buildings. And they've shown that you know, there's a lot, there, there is a, an evolved response essentially to wakefulness for that bluish spectrum that we experience in the morning. This is a, a function of environmental variables, the way the sunlight comes through the atmosphere in the morning at the, the angle that it does as opposed to later in the afternoon. So we may want to take advantage of how we orient, say, bedrooms in the house for those two, um, two different types of light. The other thing is, of course, the sun also brings with it heat. So in, in the morning, when the air is typically cooler, sun that comes in directly is not going to bring with it as much heat. It will have lost a lot of that through uh, heating up the air before it actually penetrates the structure. The wall itself will also be cooler, so that's not as transferred into the, the environment, the interior environment. By contrast, direct sun in the, in the west in the late afternoon will bring with it a fair amount of heat because, again, the atmosphere has been heated up, so those rays are not losing as much energy coming through and into the wall. The wall has also been heated up by the ambient temperature, meaning that a lot more of that direct radiation is transferred inside. So we want to think about how we're going to orient spaces to take advantage of that. Here you see we have the garage on the west wing, meaning that that heat now has an extra barrier before it gets into the comfortable condition space. If we're in the northern hemisphere, we also want to think about the fact that any southern facing orientation will have sun all day. Throughout the entirety of the year, if you live in the northern hemisphere, the sun will be skewed towards the southern portion of the sky, more so the further north you move. So that's where you're going to get your greater exposure and greater daylighting capability. On the north, you're going to get much softer light. You're going to get much more uh, reflected, um, even distributed ambient lighting. And so we can take advantage of that in different ways to create different environments. Now, that also means we're going to get a lot more heat coming in from the sun. So how we manage that is something else that we want to consider. As we think about orientation with the sun, of course, the last thing that we need, one of the things we need to consider is, is rooftop solar. If we're going to have any sort of on-site generation, again, being in the north, you want to take advantage of that sun by orienting your panels towards the south. Increasingly, we're seeing economically competitive rates for rooftop solar and new financial models, say from Solar City, Sunrun, uh, Vivint, and other similar providers as to how we can make these pervasive in the entire residential market feed-in tariffs, power purchase agreements, um, lease-to-own models, all of these are, are, are things that we're seeing. But if you want to take advantage of those, we have to think now about how to do it. We have to think about the pitch of the roof. Typically, we want to design, if we can, the roof to be around the latitude of the site, or latitude divided by two. That tends to get us either the highest summer power or the greatest amount of energy produced throughout the year. You can do a flat design, you only lose about 2 to 5%, in some cases up to 10 to 12, depending on how far north you are, uh, percent of your overall generation. And as costs come down, that's also perfectly competitive. One thing that I don't have on this slide is that in certain areas, California is a good example of this, we're now starting to incentivize west-facing solar, because all those south-facing panels get really uh, inefficient around this time of day, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, which is when we typically see peaks of electrical generation on the grid. So you'd want to look at what are the incentives in your area, and not only what are the incentives in your area now, but where are the incentives heading. Right now we're in an interesting time for PV, where there's a lot of uh, upheaval in how PV is being priced and how, generation, how tariffs are being structured in the future for photovoltaic installations, especially on roofs. So you should be thinking, again, towards the future. Where might those incentives go, and how would we structure the building to take advantage of that? I have a question here uh, before I move on. Let me back up one slide here. Question saying, do people typically put solar thermal water installations on western facing slope, or does it depend on the time of day you shower? It's a great question, but the typical tends to be the same as PV. We see them a lot on the southern facing uh, aspects of roofs, and the reason is that once we have the water heated, we can actually store it pretty efficiently for a fair amount of time. Um, showering is a very personal 
scheduled behavior. A lot of people shower in the morning, a lot in the evening. Obviously, if you're in the morning, there's a much lower that we're going to have had a lot of sun to take advantage of in order to heat the water. So we generally try and get as much energy as we possibly can, which means oriented towards the south, and then store that in a hyper-insulated tank if we possibly can. Even the best solar water heating installations often will have some sort of small uh, on-demand backup just in case for, for situations where there hasn't been a lot of sun or where it's been sitting overnight and cooled down. Great question, though. So the second factor that we want to think about in orientation is the wind. So depending on where you live, the prevailing wind direction is likely to bring in cooler air than what's just been sitting outside. Few exceptions exist. Again, I grew up in LA and the Santa Ana winds, which blow from the north northeast, often bring hot air with them. But for the most part, we want to try and take advantage of the direction of the wind to have openings in our building, as you see here in the lower right, to bring in that cooler air or uh, that fresh air at the very least and allow it to permeate the house. One poor design up here in the, the up might be to have your garage as the first thing the wind would hit, both because what it does is it pushes that wind around the house and you get far less entering penetrations on the other side of the building, but also because the garage is one of the places in your house from a health perspective that has the worst quality of air. So we wouldn't necessarily want to bring the air inside the garage, pick up VOCs, other pollutants that have been accumulating there, say the exhaust from your car, open paint cans, et cetera, and then pull that into the living spaces. We would much rather have the air, the fresh air from the wind enter directly into the house itself or into whatever our building is, and then as its final destination, flow through areas that may have higher accumulation of indoor pollutants. One thing to be considerate of, though, is, is we haven't shown what the site of this building is. Say there was a freeway running right here on the predominant wind direction, maybe we would want to rethink how we orient with the wind or how we filter or bring air into the building. So again, site variables may matter. Now, in both cases, these are very conceptual uh, things that I've shown. So how do we actually think about them analytically? One tool on the solar aspect that we use is called the Sun Path Diagram. And this can be created for any location. In fact, they're published for a lot of locations already globally. So you can look up and see what the one closest to you is. But what this tells us is what the angle of the sun is relative to the center here, the dot, um, where it is in the sky at every hour of the year. So you see lines here that are created for June 21st, May 21st, April, March, February, January, and December. And then you see our lines across uh, in the transverse direction. So what this will tell us is that we can look at any, if we're standing here at the center, any hour of the year, we can see where the sun is in the sky. Um, this one here you can see is for Rotterdam, which is in the northern hemisphere. It's pretty far north as well. Um, and so we can see where would the sun be in the sky at what time. It gives you an idea that here in Rotterdam on the shortest day of the year, the sun doesn't rise till after 8 in the morning and sets before 4. But in the summer, we've got a whole lot more sun that we can take advantage of. So now we can think about how we want to, how much sun we might be able to expect to get on our property and how to orient to take the greatest advantage of that, depending on what season and hour is most important for our panels. The other thing a sun path diagram will help us with is um, how we can expect the sun to enter the building. So I mentioned before that, especially in more, if we're in the north and we're thinking about exposure to sun from a southern aspect all day, we might not want the sun to be in our building all the time, especially perhaps in the summer when it's already warm. So we can think about, by, by studying how the sun is going to be at what angles, again, going back here, we see here different angles uh, that, we can, that we can expect the sun. We can now think about how we design overhangs to, as in this case, block the sun in the summer, but allow it to come in in the winter to passively heat the interior of our building. This is really just an exercise in trigonometry, something that uh, you may have taken in high school, you may know from uh, math classes or other that you've taken in college, or if not, if you've never had trigonometry before, don't be scared, it's not that hard, because what you can do is just using lines at the horizontal and the vertical, just play around with different overhangs and see when the direction the rays will come in. All you need is a protractor and a straight, uh, a straight edge, and you can check this for yourself. Also, 
tools like SketchUp have wonderful uh, ability to simulate sun entry into different into your building at different times, different hours of every possible day. If we put this together, you can also do it as a site simulation. So here's an example from a campus environment. Um, we can see here standing on the site taking a 360 degree panorama of the site itself and then overlaying the sun path diagram. We see that, for instance, in this case, this large tree that's right in the center might be shading us, well, through most of the year. In fact, when we would want a lot of our exposure to sun, that tree is going to be right in our way. So thinking about the surrounding site, this is another way you can use the sun path diagram to look at what resource am I actually going to have access to. And this is something that, I hate to say it, we don't do enough as engineers sometimes, is we don't always look at the shading. And it's now becoming such an issue that cities are legislating on this. Cities have started to legislate solar access laws, meaning that your neighboring building cannot ever build too high, for instance, to block your access to generate using PV on site, especially if you already have panels on your building. But for instance, San Francisco is passing a series of solar access laws showing that every building must have a certain square footage of the roof area that has access to sun. <coughs> In this case, this site would not. Now let's shift back to wind for a second. The, the tool that we use in wind assessment is called a wind rose. The wind rose that you see here is one that I've just found from, NR, uh, from the USDA. They publish a lot of wind roses. There are also tools, uh, one of my favorites is called Climate Consultant, that for a given location will create the wind rose for you. Now what the wind rose tells us is um, two things. One is the directionality of the wind. So you can see here this is arranged like a compass. We've got west, north, east, and south. Um, it tells us the mag so it tells us by the number and the, the magnitude of the bars uh, coming off radiating from the center the direction that the wind is blowing from. So here, here for instance we have a large amount of wind that's blowing from the south southwest. With some you see here there's this longer bar as well that comes from the northeast. So we see the number of hours of the year, here they're giving us percentages, that the wind is blowing from a given direction. Oftentimes this will be broken down by month. Um, I don't exactly know in this chart what the coloration is, but often it'll be colored by month. It may also be colored by velocity. So we may be able to see what fraction of the hours of the year are over, say, 10 miles an hour or below 5 miles an hour. That's important for something like uh, the wind turbines that we discussed two weeks ago at the RIT Golisano Institute, which would need to look at where is that predominant wind coming from, which side of the building is it going to hit, at what velocities, because turbines have velocities above which they cannot operate and below which they cannot operate. So do we have enough hours in that sweet spot that our on-site turbines are going to work? It's also an important thing, though, if we're going to open our building, if we're going to have windows, I keep my window is over here off of my right side. We're going to have windows. We want to think about how much wind is coming in, what's the velocity, and what season. If we're getting cold wind in the cold months, we may not actually want to have operable windows on that side, or we may control them a little bit more. Granted, there's a trade-off there. Larger windows, we'd have daylight, but we might not want them opened. However, if it's going to bring in cool air during warmer months, maybe we want to take advantage of that, provided it's not going to be so high in velocity that's going to create an uncomfortable environment in the building. Then again, we'll have to come up with some way to regulate it. So again, another very powerful tool, tool when you're beginning your site assessment to think about how do I orient my building on this windrows, on this compass, to take the greatest advantage of that resource. Now the last thing that we want to think about, and this is specific to some buildings, but it's not going to be applicable everywhere, is the ground. Sometimes we have an opportunity where we can actually build with the terrain and take advantage of the thermal mass that soil naturally provides us. Now this Hobbit house that I'm showing here is an extreme example of this, but it illustrates the point that the earth is one of the greatest insulators that we possibly have, and it's also already there. So if we can use it, we should take advantage of it. In fact, what we know is that if we go down about 12 to 18 inches into the soil, the ground temperature tends to stay a lot more temperate relative to the average temperature of an area than uh, anything above ground. It's, and it's actually pretty stable. Once we go a certain depth, um, the ground temperature doesn't vary a whole lot more by depth. So here we see 
the, the high and the low in a particular area, and the ground temperature falls typically right in the middle. There is some seasonal variation, especially at shallower depths. The deeper and deeper you go, that seasonal variation starts to even out a lot more. But what it means that is what it means is that we already have now one of our best ways of mitigating the need for cooling in the summer and heating in the winter just by using this natural insulative capacity of the ground. Now again, this isn't always going to be available, but there might be times when you can even build an earthen berm leading up to your building that's going to help take up some of that heat or some of that cooling and help insulate the building quite a bit more. Now I promised that I wouldn't take a purely energy view of all of this. Um, I do want to stress and, and spend a little bit of time talking about how we now design orientation in a very social or architectural way. My background is not as an architect or a practicing architect, but I've done quite a number of projects where I've worked with architects, and so this is all insight based on those experiences. If it were up to me as an energy person, as a mechanical engineer, as an energy modeler, I would probably end up building houses very differently than I ever actually have. And here's why. If we focus just on minimizing energy use, we can sometimes forget that people use the space. And it also should be, or we want it to be, architecturally interesting. It goes back to the building that last thesis. So economic sustainability has to be an important component. We have to make the house attractive. We have to make it marketable. We want to cater to what people actually like. Um, and so things like curb appeal, location, exterior colors, materials, landscaping, where we locate the kitchen relative to the bedrooms, to the living room, these are all really important aspects that we don't necessarily always take advantage of. Especially as energy modelers, we don't always think about these things. And yet, if you spend any time in a home or an apartment or a dorm room, you will realize what works for you, what doesn't work for you. And so we want to get in the minds of our users a little bit and think about how they're going to take advantage of all of the different objectives they really care about. I had a question here that I'm going to pause and answer before we move on. Say, is there a scenario where you have building orientation that works? works well for the sun, but not for wind and vice versa? Or do we always have a workable scenario in which good for both sun and wind? The answer is that there's very, very often a trade-off. This is a really good question. There's almost always a trade-off between orientation for sun and orientation for wind. So, for instance, um, in the example that I, that I, I mentioned very briefly, uh, where I grew up in LA, the predominant direction of wind is uh, towards the south um, and southwest. It's ocean breeze that comes off of the Pacific, and so we would really want to take advantage of that in the summer in Los Angeles, which would mean you would think from a wind perspective, large openings, large windows on that south-southwest side. The challenge with that from a sun perspective is that's also where we're going to get the greatest amount of heat from. And windows, preempting my next slide here, windows actually have the lowest thermal resistance or the greatest heat transfer capacity of any of the materials in the envelope of our building. So the more window area we have, the more sun energy, radiant heat energy is going to be uh, permitted into the building. So here we have an exact dichotomy between wanting in the evenings that breeze to be allowed in from the west but wanting to block that sun. These are things that we have to wrestle with as designers. And using energy modeling tools like eQuest, which you'll get to play with in your assignment this week a little bit, can help us understand those. These multi-physics simulations look at radiant energy. They look at convective heat transfer. They look at uh, wind flows and natural ventilation if you want to take advantage of that. So that's a really good question. And very rarely, I would say, do they actually line up perfectly. Um, and sometimes, if we're given a site, we just have to deal with what's there. We have to build the building a certain orientation. Maybe um, we're building a commercial building and we want it to front on the major thoroughfare, the major street. So we do what we have. We, we, we can't change that. So now, to get into some of the engineering principles that matter when we think about no longer orientation, but now the passive mechanisms of the building, the first is we want to think about how heat comes into the structure. We talked about heat through the sun, and that's part of the orientation challenge, but now that no matter where we build, heat is going to come through our windows and walls, how do we help prevent that? How do we passively stop the heat from getting in, allow it in when we want it, or protect and keep in whatever heat we may have generated during really cold months in, say, uh, Rotterdam or Rochester, where I know many of you are also from? If you've ever taken heat transfer, 
you'll recognize this diagram that I'm showing here, but what this is is a composite surface. In this case, it's a window. But it shows that we have one temperature inside, one temperature outside the building, and we have three different materials, each with its own thermal resistance, its own, uh, basically, it's like an electrical resistance, but for heat that prevents the temperature, the warmth from escaping from the hot side to the cool side, or vice versa if we want to keep the cool in. Typical stud frame walls, which is what we you make residential construction out of, have an insulation of about R11. Um, this uses either an air gap in the middle or a very minimal insulation. Usually R11 is the minimum that's required by code, so it will have some insulation but not a lot. Advanced wall constructions, there's a solution called structural insulated panel systems, which have a full four to six inch foam, can be R30. Sometimes we'll see roofs up to R60. And an R value, by the way, is the inverse of the heat transfer coefficient. So if you're familiar with U values instead of R values, R is just the inverse of a U value. Um, U values tend to be measured in watts per meter Kelvin. So an R value is in meter Kelvin per watt. Um, it's just what we tend to use in the construction industry. Now compare that R11 at the worst wall, R30 at a good wall to windows. Even the very best windows, and these are incredibly expensive, are R10. Most common are R1 or below on old buildings. On new buildings, somewhere around R2 or R3. Maybe up to R5 if you have a double glazed window with uh, a really well constructed frame. As an example here, polystyrene, what I mentioned is very common uh, foam core for those advanced wall systems. 35 cents a square foot. These really high performing triple pane windows, $30 a square foot. And that's compared to $10 for a single pane window. I mean, I know we're paying for the glass, but here because we have to have a very, very um, thick construction, it's not just glass, it's two thin panes of glass with three different chambers essentially inside, or sorry, three panes of glass, two different chambers, sometimes more if we have intermediate film materials that just create multiple barriers for that heat to pass through. So we want to think about the cost as well as the R value, and this is where modeling can help us. If we think about windows from a visual perspective, we want to look at the glare that windows might actually create or how they allow light in the space. This is one of the ways that we can balance how much window should we have versus, for a light perspective versus a thermal perspective. This is showing a simulation that we did for a house that I, I helped build um, where we have the major living space, and we're looking at how are these north facing windows on the upper side? These are called clear story windows on the left side here. How are those upper story windows allowing a very um, even light into the space compared with our south facing windows, which are going to allow a much more direct light in? By balancing this now with the energy modeling results, we can make decisions about are these, these uh, good to have large openings or should we be reducing the window area? In this case, we have a pretty even lighting across the surface, so this was a fairly good design. Part of the reason we're not seeing too much glare off these southern windows, you may or may not be able to see it, is there's a large overhang on the southern, the southern side. Another passive strategy that we can take advantage of is thermal mass. So just like we have resistances in our walls and our windows, using the electrical analogy again, we can have what's essentially a capacitance in our thermal mass. What this means is that the radiant heat that comes in as sunlight, either to the exterior wall, or into uh, the building can be absorbed by something with a very high uh, specific heat. So water, for example, has a very high specific heat. Concrete, rock, these are other things that have, can absorb a lot of energy. And this does two things. First, it blocks the heat now from getting into our major uh, living space, and then it also allows it to radiate back once the temperature drops. So looking at this bottom chart, what we see here is if we have an annual temperature range uh, that goes from, say, 5 or 25 to 25 to 40 degrees Celsius. With thermal mass in the way, we're absorbing a lot of that during the day when it starts to heat up and then releasing it at night. The most common way that this is done is with concrete blocks. This is often known as a trome wall. You can also use water encased in bricks or other vessels. Uh, stone is an architecturally attractive one. And then there's some really new materials that used either wax or a sort of gel polymer. Uh, DuPont makes one called Energain, but there are several others that have hit the markets in the last few years, some with natural waxes. DuPont's is, is with a, a material that they have constructed themselves. The advantage of these polymer matrices is that whereas stone and concrete have to be thick, even water, you need a lot of it, 
These take advantage of the fact that the material encased in a very narrow, maybe about a quarter inch to a half inch at most uh, matrix, actually will melt at the right temperature or will transition from a pure solid into a more gel-like material. So it's using that, that um, the, the, the uh, heat of, of um, I forget the exact term all of a sudden, my, my brain has, has gone blank on me, but it's using the added heat that's taken up in that phase change in order to uh, provide a thermal mass. The other thing that we want to think about um, when we talk about materials is reflectivity. Going back to our passive strategies here, rather one of the things we may want to do is just keep the radiation out. Rather than absorbing it and releasing it, in some cases, a desert for instance, just too much radiation is going to be impinging on the surface for us to manage. So we can use high re reflectivity materials to keep the radiation from the sun from even getting into our building. Bright color roofs, you'll hear a lot of, uh, if you go to a trade show, cool roofs. These tend to be white materials. Uh, or very light colored materials that reflect the sun especially well. Special coatings, again, paints that you can get or other metallic type of materials. Even certain novel materials really help prevent the heat getting in or escaping. You can do the same thing on the inside of your building if you're in a colder environment so that heat that rises is reflected back and stays in the building. And then the last thing, the last tool that we may have uh, in our sort of materials arsenal is the earth itself. I already talked about soil, but trees, trees and plants can help shade and cool just through transpiration. Trees have been shown and plants have been shown to reduce the ambient temperature around the building by several degrees. So what that means is that as the water vapor is coming off of the, the plants, it's absorbing the heat before it even has a chance to reach the building. And by keeping that environment around your building even, um, even cooler, then there's a, a far less amount of heat that you have to deal with inside the building. Water features as well. Uh, Las Vegas, the Bellagio Fountain, is known to reduce the ambient temperature around it by up to five degrees in the middle of summer, potentially more. Uh, the challenge there, of course, is should we be building a water feature in Las Vegas in the first place, given that they don't have much water? That discussion will reserve for another time, but it's something from an energetic perspective to consider. Karen showed you quite a few diagrams like this uh, last week, but my point here is think about where the heat is moving, think about where it's coming from, and Karen talked a lot about that, so I'm not going to go deep into this, but it's important even in new buildings to remember that heat is going to rise, it's going to want to get out through areas that we have openings, through where we have windows, and how should we manage those roof spaces, those attic spaces, so that the heat either is productively reused or doesn't then um, say heat the cool air that's coming from our air conditioner before it enters our space. That's actually a common mistake that was done in a lot of homes over the last 50 years that you would run the cold air duct in the attic where it gets the hottest. Well, all I've done is heat the cold air that I wanted to cool the space with and I didn't really do that much. Karen talked about infiltration. Again, something we really have to think about in new buildings. You want to seal every, uh, every joint as you build it. And then humidity as well. Humidity is the hardest thing to deal with, and if you don't deal with it up front through using desiccation or keeping the humid air out of the building, it's much harder to deal with once it's in the building itself. Just a reminder, um, Karen talked about blower door tests for, uh, for infiltration last week. We do them on new construction as well. We're really trying to get 0.3 air changes per hour as an average. We really want to be as small as possible on infiltration, typically with new buildings, uh, so that we control a lot more of when we're bringing air in, when air is coming out, and what we're doing to heat and cool it in advance. Once again, trade-offs exist. We, I mentioned before trade-offs in, in wind and sun. Oftentimes, it may have sounded like some of the, the features that I'm saying are the worst for energy, windows for instance, well they're the ones that we and architects like the best. So we got to think about how are we going to very carefully manage these, uh, the ability to open your windows for instance relative to the interior environment, how many windows we have, just to make sure that the energy is not unduly compromised as we make a nice building. But again, trade-offs are a part of the, they're, they're, they're part of the game here. So I've spent most of this lecture now talking about passive systems. 
before even getting into the active systems. And that's because in this integral design, that's really what we want to focus on. Once we get in the active systems, there's a lot less that we have in our toolbox to play with. Most of what 10 years ago was revolutionary is now standard in buildings. And certainly, um, there are advanced things that we can talk about. And this is going to be one of the options that you'll get in the poll after this class for what we spend the last lecture on. We talk about some really advanced uh, geothermal heating and cooling systems, um, condenser water or chilled water, chilled beams, things that use a lot less energy to provide the same look, excuse me, of heating and cooling. But overall, once we're at this stage, we've eliminated as much of the load as possible, and now we're looking just to get the most efficient appliances or heating and cooling that we possibly can, and then controlling it in a really smart way. The Nest thermostat, others are great examples of smart control and feedback control. The first thing though is to think about where are we actually using energy? And we talked about this in week one, so just a reminder, we've got a lot of appliances, some of which like the refrigerator may use a lot of energy and be on pretty constantly. Uh, others like the microwave, a lot more energy, but not constantly on. We've got lighting, we've got heating, cooling, entertainment. In the typical house, uh, the water heater, though, something we don't necessarily think about is, is often our largest source of electricity use. In California, we have natural gas water heaters. Much of the country has electric water heaters, though, and that can be a huge load. Many of these we don't want to compromise. We're not going to cut them out regardless, so we do want to think about how we manage those loads. In commercial buildings, we have a lot more advantage a lot more ability to manage some of those loads because the fact that the space of a commercial building is used in a very diverse manner, we have more opportunities for thermal mass, means that when we get to the active systems, there are more levers that we can pull. In addition, the passive strategies only go so far with commercial buildings. Commercial buildings are mostly cooling dominated, meaning that no matter what climate you're in, you're going to have more cooling load with a commercial building than you might expect. And that's because we have what's called a core section of the building. This is just the name that we've given it. But past about the first 25 feet within your building, the sun's energy doesn't penetrate as much. So we can't heat that building, but it gets heated by all of the people, all of the activities that happen in there. That tends to be a warmer area. That, that heat also doesn't get out through that 25-foot zone. So we need to deal with that. That's where a lot of our active strategies come in play in a commercial building. <laughs> now, even though the structures look different, as I said at the start of today, the same strategies that we went through still apply. So we might think about doing things like this. This is uh, a building at Stanford, actually. And here we've got, you can see these large skylights over atria that run all the way through our buildings to bring in natural lighting brings in direct sunlight at certain times and more oblique sunlight at other times. These actually have panels on them that change the angle of reflection of the sun and can shade some of this space. We've got overhangs here that help the sun miss on the most exposed side of the building. We have um, shading and overhangs as well on the exterior of the building. And then we have what are called light shelves here that allow in the winter months that winter sun to come in, be reflected off the light shelf and deeper into the building so that we have more heating and more sunlight that gets into that space. Another example here of shades that get applied on a commercial building. You can see here that these are potentially also movable uh, to take advantage of different angles throughout the year that might be required. In this particular building that I showed before, this is the interior of it, we can apply thermal mass in the commercial building. This is a concrete floor, an exposed concrete floor that takes in that heat and releases it back overnight so that it reduces the heating and cooling loads in the building. Now this is also known as an active uh, chilled floor because there are pipes embedded in this concrete that will bring the heat that comes in through that 25 foot zone radi circulated into the interior of the building to heat that concrete as well. So we're getting over that fact that the, the, the fact of that, that edge zone, the perimeter zone, and the core zone by taking the heat that comes in circulating it actively into the core of the building, but with far less energy than it would take just to heat that directly with a boiler, and then continuously, continuously doing that loop so that at night we can radiate that back. In commercial buildings um, or in residential buildings, now that we've gotten to the act active strategies, one of the things that we want to think about is, is how do we use less energy? And one of the technologies that's really gotten a lot more play recently are heat pumps. Heat pumps are a thermodynamic, basically they're a reverse refrigerator. They take heat and they move it through a fluid that evaporates and condenses um, very efficiently from a place where we want it colder, or sorry, hotter to a place where we want it colder, or vice versa. 
heat recovery, I mentioned at the beginning, once we have heated or cooled our resource, before we just blow it out of the building, which is often what we do, especially in a commercial building, we may have one part of the building that's heating, one part that needs cooling. So we're going to take the heat from that part that wants to be cooled, we're going to just move it into the part that wants to be hot, rather than in an older setting, we would have taken it from the cooled part of the building, thrown it into the atmosphere, and then fired a boiler to heat the part of the building that needed warmth. And then the final thing that we can do is, is we waste a lot of energy heating to 100, 120, 160 degrees Fahrenheit for water or air that comes into our buildings to heat the space, and cooling water, on the other hand, to 34 or 42 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we moderate those temperatures, we can bring it to more of an intermediate range, 60 to 85, and that allows us to uh, use less energy, waste less energy by moving that around, and still affect the same sort of heating and cooling. One final thing that um, a lot of new developments do is use what's called district heating and cooling. And here you aggregate all of your buildings together, and then you build one central air conditioner and heater for the entire development. You move that hot and chilled resource around by pipes. You just pipe the water from building to building. This is a lot more efficient because thermal systems, boilers, air conditioners, have an economy of scale. The larger that we get, the more efficient that they are. So if we can centralize that load, not only do we add resilience, meaning that if one of these units goes down, we can still provide heating and cooling typically to most, if not all, of the buildings or at the same level. But it also means that we can operate these units a lot more efficiently, and now we also have a centralized place for doing heat recovery. With a chiller, for instance, a, a large air conditioner, um, chillers reject heat as they're cooling water. So we can take that rejected heat, we can just send it straight over to our hot water generators, to our boilers, and then use it when we send it out to the buildings. This is hard to retrofit, but if you're going to build an entire new community or a new city, and it doesn't even have to be a large community, um, I've been involved with design teams looking at these for about 20 acres or maybe the scope of a college campus, um, which would be more on the, the size of, of 500 to 1,000 acres. We've seen them at that size. I've seen them as small as three to four buildings. We're doing one down here in the, the South Bay area of, of California for about four buildings. So you can do this and get advantage on even a smaller scale, um, but it's certainly something to think about. Again, I'm happy to go into a lot more detail offline or at a later time. Uh, but this is just an interesting approach. So one of the things you're going to do in your assignment this week is to start to take a crack at modeling all of these, these different approaches that we've talked about. And so I'm going to spend the last five minutes talking about some of the different softwares that's out there and then that are out there, excuse me, and then introducing the one that you're going to use in your assignment this week. I mentioned already Google SketchUp. It's a great architectural tool for early modeling. Once we get into later stage building modeling, we typically move to Autodesk Revit, and this is kind of the industry standard for architectural modeling. Um, Rhino is another one that's used for um, visual modeling of buildings. And then there's a whole suite of tools that I don't even know or understand that architects use for producing really high quality renderings and images. But Autodesk Revit, is nice because it's a building information modeling tool, which means that we can actually imbue the walls that we design or the windows with properties that tell us about the energy or about the lighting. We can import models from Revit into tools like Radiance or AGI32 to get a sense of the lighting. So that image I showed earlier of the interior of the house with the light coming in, um, that was done in, uh, in um, I'm sorry, in Radiance, uh, which is kind of the industry standard, this, this slide here want to pull it up. This was done in Radiance, and we see uh, what this does is it traces every light ray that comes into the building and actually um, then models its, its visual impact. For energy, uh, we can use eQuest, which is the tool that you're going to use in your assignment this week. It's still the industry standard, even though it's been around for now 20 years. It was first introduced in 1995, so 21 years. Um, Energy Plus is a new tool that the Department of Energy has sponsored development of through the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and NREL that is a far more powerful tool than eQuest. Uh, it has a lot more features, but it's also a lot harder to use. And then increasingly, Energy Plus and eQuest are being integrated directly into Revit. So once you build your building, you can just hit Simulate, and it will go. And then finally, if we want to do any sort of advanced airflow modeling, Energy Plus has a great natural ventilation model, which means if we're looking at ventilation coming in through open windows or different openings, Energy Plus handles it. If we want to do it better, 
we want to use a fluid mechanics modeling tool like Comsol or like Autodesk's Sim CFD, which again integrates nicely with Revit. Not trying to promote Autodesk unduly here necessarily, but they are the industry standard. And if you're planning to go in this field, it's a tool that you should get to know. And the sooner you do, the greater advantage you're going to have. Just to show you what some of these look like, uh, building models, uh, upper left here I have SketchUp, lower right I have Autodesk's Revit tool. So you see the big difference here in the way that the materials look, but even this lower right one still doesn't look as realistic. I mean, we have just repeated patterns on some of the materials. So we can go, this, go one step further with some of those advanced modeling tools that I mentioned, but I don't know how to use. That would give us really realistic looking buildings. SketchUp's quick. It's free. Um, it's actually no longer owned by Google. I apologize. My slide is out of date. It's owned by Tecla now. But again, worth learning, and you can do some very basic analyses around shading, and even with some other plugins on uh, energy. They have a plugin for Energy Plus. It just doesn't work that well yet. For lighting models, I showed you before they, the model from Radiance. This on the left is a simulation of a hospital room from AGI 32. It's also a ray trace program, meaning that it will look at here this window, say in the background, and these light fixtures in red above. Look at where the light is being cast around the room. In this case, these are fixtures that direct the light upwards, so you see a high concentration on the ceiling. You see a high concentration on the wall underneath the bedside lamp. And we can look at, is the room fairly evenly lit? Where are the hot spots where there might be glare? Same thing over here on the right where we're looking at um, ray traces within the building, but in this case looking also at thermal indicators. One tool that a lot of us still use uh, at some point in design are actual physical models. You can build models out of foam core. Uh, this is something that a lot of architectural schools teach. Put them on a table like this on the left where uh, this is called a, a, a uh, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting my, my words here all of a sudden. Basically, you can put this on a table that simulates the path of the sun, again, in all those axis, axes that we saw in the sun path diagram, and physically look at where light's being penetrated. It's less precise, but it can give a nice physical form, and a lot of clients like to see something like this because they actually now can visualize much better being in that space. The energy tools, the energy modeling tools I mentioned already. I've got links here, and these slides are now on uh, the course website. So if you want to take a look at any of the energy modeling tools in particular, you can follow these links. But just to give you a brief history before introducing the assignment, uh, 1973 was the first time that we had a computational energy simulation program. Again, motivated by the OPEC oil crisis, the realization that our buildings were using a lot of energy. Um, we started computationally modeling them. In the 1980s, uh, the predominant engine was developed by the DOE. It was called BLAST, and this was the first hourly simulation tool that looked at energy in a computational fashion and balanced all of those different factors uh, in a time series approach. BLAST was abandoned in the mid-80s because computational power had advanced far beyond what it was capable of, so this new engine called DOE2, or DO2 is what a lot of us refer to it as, uh, was developed and DO2 became the basis of eQuest in 1995. By 2000, uh, LEED had appeared on scene and it not only said you have to use energy simulation in order to get LEED certified, it went one step further and said the best one out there is eQuest. You should use eQuest. There were a couple of other competing models that it also approved at that time, but most people fell in the habit of using eQuest because it was at that time the most advanced engine and the easiest to use. But again, in 1998, the DOE looked around and said, computational power is far beyond what we could do. We don't do natural ventilation very well. It doesn't do certain daylighting aspects very well. So they abandoned it again, started from scratch with something called Energy Plus. Energy Plus is still in active development. Um, just last year, it was transferred from Fortran to C++, um, which is a big switch. <laughs> It's something we'd all kind of been waiting for, for those of us who like to play with energy simulation and actually dig into the code. But all of them do essentially the same thing. They're a multi-physics simulation that traces rays that come into the building for heat transfer, for lighting. Uh, it iteratively solves every single space in the building in every hour. So what that means is it will calculate the temperature in one section, the temperature in another, the heat transfer between, keep doing it until it reaches a convergence criterion. And then on top of that, it will simulate the internal loads, people, appliances, equipment, lights, ventilation. 
iterate over and over till you get convergence, and that will give you back the answer. eQuest is similar, except it doesn't do it iteratively. It makes assumptions, uses a sequential solver, and then manages the error, sort of massages it at points along the way. But it can lead to a lot more error than Energy Plus because it's not iterating, it's not taking into account some of the ray trace effects. So if we're thinking about which one to use, Energy Plus more accurate, more inputs. One other key thing, not a good interface for it. It's really hard to learn to use. eQuest is much similar, far quicker, uh, but you can have a lot more error. So that's the one that we're going to use for your assignment this week. And I know that this has been a ton of material and not a lot of um, interaction. This is the only lecture that we have that doesn't have as much interaction. And I apologize for that, but it's a lot of, a lot of concepts to get through. And so your assignment for this week is to actually go out and try this. eQuest is free to use. It's free to download. The download link is the one that I linked three slides back, and we'll send it out in the email uh, blast for this week as well. But download eQuest. Uh, it's very user-friendly, very light. Walk through the schematic design wizard. This is a tool that they've built that, that goes frame by frame with all of the information that you need for your building. It more or less follows the process that we've gone through here, where you'll walk through first, where is your building located? What's its orientation and massing? What loads does it have? What's its air conditioning and heating system? And then it will show you your building. Simulate it, see what kind of energy performance it has. Go back, change some of the parameters, try it again, see what you get out of it. Play around with a little bit uh, how much changing your insulation, your windows, your lighting affects the overall energy performance. What I would like you to do is either after that take a screenshot of your building, uh, some of the things that you changed, the outputs, put those in the assignment folder for next week. Um, or you can feel free to upload your entire model or some of the direct outputs, some of the reports that Energy Plus prints as well. Just make sure your name's on it so we know who's submitting them. And we'll go through some of those next week and talk about some of the things that you tried. Um, a couple of things as well. There's an eQuest tutorial that I put together a couple of years ago that will be in the, um, in the folder. Uh, in the, the class folder later this evening, as well as a video of a lecture that I did walking specifically through eQuest uh, that you should have access to, that will grant you access to. And if you have any questions on modeling, feel free to reach out or just search the web. There's a ton of good forums online already for helping with eQuest in particular. So I know we're five minutes over. I apologize for that. Um, if you have uh, any other questions, I'm happy to stick around for a little while. Otherwise, that's all. Um, next week we're going to have Aaron Lennox who's going to be joining us to talk about some advanced designs and advanced materials in uh, new energy, new building construction. Uh, she'll be talking about things like um, hay bale construction and uh, rammed earth, some very cool advanced concepts. You'll also be getting a poll um, later this week about what we want the last topic to be, what you guys want the last topic to be. We've got a couple of different options building on what we've talked about in some of the other lectures, so we'd love to get your feedback and make sure it's appropriate for whatever you're interested in. So with that, have a wonderful Tuesday. Uh, if you're a basketball fan, enjoy the Warriors and the Thunder tonight, and uh, other than that, we'll see you all back here same time, same place next week. Thanks a lot.